Today's topic is progressive taxation. I'm Leandra Letterman. And I'm Miranda Fleischer from the University of San Diego School of Law. And it's time to break into tax. So today we're talking about progressivity, which is a surprisingly controversial concept that is actually tied to a surprisingly uncontroversial concept, which is this notion of vertical equity. This is the idea that those with more should pay more. There are really two ways of interpreting what it means for those with more to pay more. So first we could say that those with more should pay more in dollars, even if everyone pays the same percentage of their income. So someone who earns $100,000 might pay $20,000. Someone who earns $50,000 might pay $10,000. So they're paying the same percentage, but the upper income person is paying more in terms of dollars. That's called a proportionate tax. Then the other way of implementing vertical equity is what we would consider a progressive tax, where those with more pay more both in terms of dollars and percentages. So our $100,000 taxpayer might pay, say, $35,000, a rate of 35%, and our $50,000 taxpayer might still pay at a rate of 20% or $10,000. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about progressive taxation, the idea that you're paying a larger percentage, not just more in dollars. And that concept of vertical equity is an important tax policy principle The Break Into Tax video, Three Tax Policy Principles Unlocked, briefly covers vertical equity as well as the related concept of horizontal equity. So be sure to check out that video as well. So proportional tax is also known as a flat tax, Mm -hmm. where there's one flat rate. Now, keep in mind that even if there's only one rate, technically, there's often also a zero bracket where the first dollars just simply do not get taxed at all. That's a great point, Leandra. And actually a flat rate tax with a big exemption is another way of implementing overall progressivity without necessarily having progressive rates. That's right, because for example, we could have a tax rate of 20%, but let's say it doesn't apply to the first $50,000 of income. So a taxpayer who earns $50,000 is taxed at a rate of zero. And then a taxpayer who earns $51,000 is taxed at a 20% rate, but only on the $1,000 above the $50,000 exemption. So that would be $200 of tax in this example. And obviously, as someone earned more and more income, their overall tax bill would go up. So before we get into the differences between a progressive and a proportionate tax, it's important to note that there's a third type of system that we could have if we wanted to, which would be a regressive tax. And this is a system where the percentage of one's income that one ends up paying increases as one's income decreases. So for example, a regressive rate structure would be one for maybe your first $100,000 is taxed at 30%, and then your next dollars of income are taxed at a lower rate, say 15%. You could also have a system that doesn't appear regressive, but in practice is regressive. And a type of tax known as a poll tax or a head tax where everyone pays the same dollar amount regardless of their income is regressive in practice. So imagine a $10,000 poll tax. Someone who earns $20,000 has to pay $10,000. Their tax rate is 50%. Someone who earns $100,000 also has to pay $10,000. Their tax rate is only 10%. Hardly anyone thinks that regressive taxes are a good idea, though sometimes when we're imposing taxes for social policy reasons, they end up having regressive effects, and that has to be one of the trade-offs that is weighed against whatever social policy reason we're pursuing. For better or for worse, we tend to view sort of a flat rate as the default. And as you pointed out recently, Miranda, in the misconceptions about tax video, that's not because having more tax rates makes a tax system a lot more complex. That's really not what makes the federal income tax complex. Right. It does make it a little bit more complex in terms of people engaging in planning techniques, but that's a very, very small part of the big web of complexity that is the tax system. 
the existence of progressive rates does create opportunities for income shifting that results in anti-abuse rules like the assignment of income doctrine. So if you have, for example, two family members and one of them has more income and so that their next dollars is going to be taxed, let's say at a 30% rate, whereas if the other family member earned that income, it would only be taxed at a 20% rate, there is a temptation for the higher income taxpayer to try to shift that income to the lower income taxpayer so that the family as a whole just pays less tax. Yeah. And it, a lot of the complexity and partnership rules comes from this idea too, trying to shift around income and deductions among partners. Because the partners often yeah. face different tax rates. On the deduction side, the deduction is more valuable to the higher income taxpayer who's taxed at a higher marginal rate than it is to the lower income taxpayer who's taxed at a lower marginal rate. And Leander, I see two other complications. One is that taxpayers with lumpy earnings, so tax at a low rate run year and a high rate another year, end up paying at an overall higher rate than taxpayers with smooth earnings. And so taxpayers will try to rearrange their affairs in order to have smoother earnings. And also, it's very hard to treat marriage and being single equally when you have a progressive rate system. So should $400,000 be taxed the same regardless if it's earned by a single person or, or by a married couple? Tax rates can be part of a so-called marriage penalty or marriage bonus. Yes, for very few people does the tax code treat marriage neutrally. We tend to view a flat rate as the default. The reason I think that it's natural, Leander, let me know if you agree with this or not, is that when we think of doing something jointly with our friends, say going on a vacation, our gut instinct is usually, well, there are 10 of us going on vacation. We should split the cost of this house into 10. That's a really good point, but I would counter with some other examples. For example, when three people share a three bedroom apartment and one bedroom is much nicer than the other two, they might divide the rent in some proportion other than one third, one third, one third. And then even if people are partners and they're sharing the entire space, you also do get situations where people share the rent or other expenses proportionate to their income. And that may particularly be true where, for example, let's, let's say you have one of the partners bringing in 80% of the income for the couple, and they simply wouldn't be able to afford as nice a place if they were limited to something that they were going to split 50-50. Yeah, I really like those examples you just gave about roommates or partners splitting up a house. And I think they bring to the fore maybe a few different ways we think about taxes which informs whether we might prefer a proportionate or a progressive tax system. So some people view taxes as tied to the benefits we get from the government. So on that view, if you have a bigger room, you're benefiting more from the house, and it might not actually be progressive for the person with the bigger room to be paying more. If you subscribe to taxes as paying for benefits, then if you think progressive rates should be higher, one would need to justify a higher income person is actually benefiting to a disproportionate extent from government benefits than a lower income person. But your second example was about ability to pay, really. And I think this is one of the stronger arguments in favor of having a progressive rate structure. So could you explain a little bit more about how ability to pay ties into a progressive rate structure? Sure. And actually, in the three tax policy principles unlocked, Allison Christians and I talk about both the benefits principle and ability to pay. So the idea behind ability to pay is that with increasing income, you have the wherewithal to pay higher taxes. And that implicates the idea of progressivity because of the notion of declining marginal utility of money. That idea that as you earn more, that next dollar or the next hundred or next thousand dollars just doesn't have as much usefulness to you as it does to someone who's earning much less. Yeah, and I think we can all recognize that there's at least some truth in that. So for example, when I was in law school, my grandmother would send me $50 for Christmas and boy, that $50 really made a big difference to me. Now, the thought makes a difference to me, but the $50 itself doesn't impact my daily life the way it did when I was a law student and living off of loans and just kind of scraping by. If you think of 
the $10,000 head tax and you have the person who, let's say all they earned for the year was $10,000, you have the person who earned $100,000 and you have the person who earned a million dollars, you can see the level of sacrifice if the person who only earned $10,000 has to pay a $10,000 head tax, they have sacrificed all of their income right. for the year. The person who earned $100,000 paying $10,000 to the government, they feel that that's a sacrifice, but it's much less significant. But then if you compare that to the person who earned a million or a hundred million at a certain point, $10,000 is going to become like a rounding error. Yeah. They're, they're really not going to notice it at all. So you can yeah. see that even a large number like $10,000 has declining marginal utility. Yes. When we start thinking about it, in terms of tax burdens, it raises another question to me. Let's say that we've got a $10,000 taxpayer, a $100,000 taxpayer, and a million dollar taxpayer. If we take 10% from all of them, is that an equal burden on all of them? Or because of the declining marginal utility, do we need to take more from the million dollar person than from the $100,000 person? And then again, from the $10,000 person for them to sort of feel like they're sacrificing equally. So is taking a thousand from the $10,000 person the same as taking 10,000 from the $100,000 person or not? That's where the question comes up with progressive rates. The question of whether there's declining marginal utility of money is an empirical one. Miranda, has anyone ever tried to measure that? People do. It's obviously very, very hard to measure. But there are some things that some economists have looked at. People often equate happiness with utility. So they'll try to study happiness across countries. There are also studies like the happiness of lottery winners doesn't go up after they win the lottery, which supports it. And some people think that really what matters in terms of our happiness is our relative position vis-a-vis -vis other people, which again, cuts in favor of it. It is awfully hard to measure, and it's a very open question as to whether it increasing rate system that we have sort of reflects the extent to which it exists or not. And happiness levels in countries also correlate with income inequality, don't they? So if you have greater income inequality, my understanding is that that generally leads to lower happiness, which would provide a reason for redistribution. Yes, that's a great point. And that brings us into one of the other common arguments for having a progressive tax system, which is that it's necessary or perhaps a more efficient way of redistributing income to people who are on the lower end of the income spectrum, either because you care about inequality per se, or you want to fund programs that enable equality of opportunity for a variety of reasons. Let's assume for purposes of this video that we want to engage in some amount of redistribution. One argument that sometimes comes up is that you can redistribute with flat rates. So you can imagine a 10% flat rate of the $100,000 a million dollar taxpayer would be paying. You can still take some of that and give it to a lower income person. So some view that as, as more desirable because you could have the redistribution and you could stay away from some of the distortions or, or, or small scale complexities that come from having a whole bunch of different rates. And it's my understanding that a lot of the Scandinavian countries have a much flatter system than we do and still engage in substantial amounts of redistribution. But that's not the tack that we've taken here. Why do you think we've taken a different tack here in the US? I think there's two important points to keep in mind here. First of all, there's not only the tax system, there's also the transfer system. And what happens at the transfer level can be very intertwined with taxation. So it's hard to simply just view tax progressivity or the lack of it in a vacuum and examine results. The second thing is that the US is very different from countries like Scandinavian countries, both in terms of its history and the level of equality of opportunity and in terms of the extent of social safety net. So the amount of redistribution that may be needed in the U.S. is likely to be very different from what's needed in a country with a lot less income inequality, for example.
Yeah, thanks for pointing out those differences. I, I think it's important to note that all of these tax design decisions come within a broader societal context. That's right. And then there's also the idea that participating in the tax system also has symbolic aspects. It's different to say that somebody is exempt from paying taxes versus collecting tax money from them and maybe using it on services that benefit that person. What it makes me think about is having a progressive system without as much redistribution is mathematically the same as having a flat rate system with some redistributions. Let's say you have a system with a 10% rate and a $100,000 taxpayer and a $10,000 taxpayer. So you've got $11,000 of revenue raised and you could just redistribute back $1,000 to the lower income person. Now, in effect, they've paid zero. You could also get the same result by just taxing them zero and taxing the upper income person at 10%. And I think which makes more sense for a given society just depends on a whole host of societal context factors. One possible issue there could be if you're designing the tax system, do you trust the transfer side? Do you trust that if you take $1,000 from the lower income taxpayer, that that $1,000 will actually be redistributed to that taxpayer? And if you don't, then a tax system design that takes zero from that taxpayer and raises it all from the higher income taxpayer may be your preference. Right. There are interesting questions about efficiency that come up that way. So Leandra, I want to pick up on something you mentioned earlier, which was this notion that having flat rates with a big exemption creates progressivity. One other thing that has the same effect that is rising in popularity is the idea of a demigrant. So a demigrant is when everyone gets a set sum of money each year, $10,000 or $12,000. And if you think about it, if everyone gets that sum of money from the government tax-free, then even if the rest of their money is taxed, it effectuates progressivity for exactly the same mathematical reasons you just talked about. The universal basic income idea is an example of the demigrant concept. And it also illustrates how the tax and transfer systems are intertwined again, because a demigrant is a transfer from the government. In addition to universal basic income, the idea of demigrants appears in a few other areas too. And they've become increasingly popular, not just with Democrats, but also with some Republicans. So often in election years, Republican presidential hopefuls will put forth various tax plans. You may have heard of some of them, the USA tax, the fair tax, the 999 tax. And a lot of times those taxes have much flatter rates than what we currently do. But in order to offset some of the decreased progressivity that comes with it, they often come with demigrants. So maybe everyone pays a slightly higher flat rate, but then lower income people get a demigrant. And that's becoming more popular on both sides of the political aisle. And very interestingly, the 2016 libertarian presidential candidates plan featured a demigrant of this nature. This has been Progressive Taxation. And thanks for joining us as we break into tax. Don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the Break Into Tax YouTube channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video when it drops. Mm -hmm.